So someone on Facebook posted this comment the other day. He said, upon reading the last page of some book, he threw the book against the wall. He was so angry about how this book ended, he just threw the book against the wall. And in his post, he he said the name of this book was called Gone Girl. So my curiosity was piqued, and and I looked it up and discovered that Gone Girl is a popular book. And um, then I heard a podcast interview with the director, David, David Fincher, for the release of a movie that was based on the book. I, I loved this, this director, David Fincher. He, he, he directed Seven, Fight Club, Zodiac, The Social Network. He did some House of Cards episodes, The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, the American version. And Panic Room. Uh, and Panic Room, <laughs> The Curious Case of Benjamin Button, and Alien 3, which I actually liked Alien 3. Uh, well, Alien 3 was no Alien 4, that's for sure. So I had to see it based just on the director alone, uh, mainly for Fight Club and Zodiac, which are two of my favorite movies. So I saw it and then immediately thought we should do a podcast about it. So welcome to the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a professor and a licensed therapist. I'm Umberto Castaneda. I'm actually a lighting director for many of David Fincher's movies. So today we're going to have a lot of spoilers. So if you haven't seen the movie, and this is one of those movies you do not want to have spoiled. Yeah. So if you haven't seen the movie, I highly recommend you turn this off and listen and go watch the movie and then come back and listen to this because you will be very upset. It's The movie is really that good. And, and I just really, watched it, by the way. Yeah, you just saw it. I, I mean, I literally, on the way here, stopped at a movie theater and watched it. I know. So what was your reaction? What did you think? I had no idea what was re- what it was really about. In fact, I did assume that it was kind of like, what was that movie? I didn't see it, but that movie that came out. Prisoner? Maybe that was it, yeah. And I didn't see it, but but I thought it was that kind of movie, you know, like really depressing. And she, you know... And it was all about this that guy's was a great movie, by the girl way. gone gone away for real and all this stuff, right? Yeah. And that's what I thought. But I also had heard some very upset people, actually. Like people saying, like, God, I hate the last part of that movie or that book or whatever. And so I was very curious about it. Upon watching it, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. I was pleasantly surprised. I mean, I have some critiques for sure, but I enjoyed it from beginning to end. There was definitely some cool twists and... Ultimately, I, I see why some types of people might find it upsetting, but I also wonder how they enjoyed the ending of American Psycho or Fight Club or many other, or The Graduate or, or many other movies that don't end in a settling note. Well, let's get into it. Let's just get in. Let's just talk about the ending because because I'm curious to hear what you have to say. Yep. Uh, so again, spoiler alert uh, for the rest of the podcast. It starts off at at the beginning of the movie for the first third of the movie it's a long movie it's about two and a half hours for the first third of the movie the there's a husband who finds out that his wife is missing and so it's it's a very typical story you know they they do a media event they don't know where she is and there's police officers and it's it's a who done it and then the second third of the movie you realize that the wife isn't dead because she's presumed dead in the first third of the movie. She, it's like she's dead and everyone's thinking that the husband did it. And and then you realize that she's alive and that she manipulated everyone to believe that the husband did it right. and tried to cover it up. And then the final third of the movie, uh, basically it's this jumble of things, but essentially the wife and the husband get back together. The wife manipulates everyone, including the husband, who now hates her with a passion to stay married to her and raise their soon-to-be-born child together. Right. And incidentally, she's only pregnant because she stole his sperm from a sperm bank without his permission and got pregnant that way. Right. She, he never intended on, on, on getting her pregnant S- because for a long time they'd been, they'd been having a lot of marital problems. And so it's a very screwed up movie. It's okay. not a very uh, uplifting story. It makes, I think, people quite paranoid about their partners. <laughs> the whole premise of the movie is you don't really know your spouse. How can you know what's really going on in their minds? It is. If you don't, like I said, if you walk into it knowing very little like I did, right? The movie starts with what you described, the usual tone. 
the usual somber tone of my wife's missing. What? And but let me ask you: Did you think it's Nick and Amy? Did you think Nick did it as the procedural um, was unfolding? No, no I, as, at the first part of the movie, no, because either they were in my mind they were doing one of two things: either they were committing a movie sin by 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 acting a little too well in its and his defense. And, you know, basically contriving it because, you know, they show us several scenes by himself and things like that. And you can, as a director, certainly fool anyone into anything as long as you direct the scenes a certain way. So I thought either they're doing that, which I have enough respect for Fincher to think he wasn't. Or I I really saw that he was really confused as to what the hell was going on. So in my mind, I thought, no, I don't think he did this. Right. And it would have been such a weird movie to have been made. That's right. Where you start off with the disappearance of this wife, right. it immediately gets investigated and people start suspecting the husband and it's the husband. Right. Do you know, like that would have been the, the, the dumbest, most odd, uncompelling. <laughs> so so that that was one thing. But, but you're saying that the reaction of the character seemed consistent with someone that was innocent. It, it did. And I'm glad in the end he was because I was like, great. So they kept that. But then what they did do, which the initial part that was very interesting is when they're showing us the, as we later learn, is an unreliable narrator. But at first, we don't know that. And they show us her side of the story with him hit, you know, pushing her down and her being afraid for him, from, you know, of him. And at that moment, you think, in my mind anyways, I thought, oh, okay, I still don't think he killed her, but there's more to him than we realize, right? I right. thought that. But I actually didn't necessarily see the the cliche affair coming right and this is okay by the way this is one of the things that i both like but i also if i were critiquing the movie i would critique it but in the end i like its quirkiness it shifts tone as the movie goes through and it, and it actually doesn't shift tone permanently it keeps going back and forth and, and what i mean by that is at one point in the movie it's very zomb- somber very realistic very you know uh almost Like seven, you know, seven is very much like that the whole way through. And then all of a sudden it gets very humorous, you know, and you're like, oh, that's funny. And it gets kind of almost. When's um, the humorous part? Oh, there's many humorous parts. Like uh, anytime you're seeing the the reporter, the, the, um, oh yeah, that, that lady, it's so over the top. Right. And then, and and not to say that there aren't people like that in the media. It's just that anytime you see that in reality, it's humorous. Right. Right. And then, and then when they, they do certain twists that, that are a little humorous, like uh, where, where you see, um, like when the when the eighteen year old comes out and or I don't know she's eighteen actually that's part of the point she looks like she's eighteen when she comes out in the media and she's confessing that she had an affair she's in her early twenties right he says. and then Ben Ben Affleck's character is like uh, sitting there in disbelief in the meantime you see the other gal like oh my god what a bitch <gasps> she's pretending and then she's like the the huge cum on my tits is pretend you know and that's kind of fu- this dark f- humor to it. You know, and there isn't any of that in seven. Like seven is straight from beginning to end. There is no dark humor to it. There's only bleak reality. Right. This one shuffles back and forth. And I in the end, I like it because of it. And and maybe that is what where it succeeds. It makes you second guess yourself because of that. Because you're like, wait, wait, wait. Oh, I see. This is a little wacky. Oh, wait, no, no, no. This is kind of bleak. Like when she first starts narrating her her real situation and, and she's driving in the car and she's like, so anyway, so I planned all this out and all these things. You're like, oh shit, okay, she's like a psychopath, okay, and this got real all of a sudden. And then she starts looking really like uh, bad, and she like hits herself with a freaking mallet and all these things, and it gets really dark, right? And so you're thinking, okay, that's kind of where this where this is headed. But then a few scenes later, they do some some funny things with like when she's meeting the neighbor and, when she, and all these kind of things, um, and and then it gets kind of over the top again. And so they, they keep shifting back and forth like it's that. It's interesting. I, I didn't notice that. I didn't notice the humor, one. I also didn't notice the shifting of tone. The, the only tone shifting I, I noticed was toward the end when things really started to get out of control. Like when she kills Doogie Hauser and when she makes him do the dip in front of the media, you know, when yep. she's walking up yeah, to the house. Yeah, that's one of those humorous moments, in my opinion. H- humor is a weird word for it, and I hear other film critics using words. Like, the, there are people that say, like, Goodfellas is a, is a comedy. Yeah, it's got a lot of 
humor or know? or american hustle is a comedy or something yeah and and, and i just <laughs> that's not what i the word i would put to it there's dark humor in those movies it, it's it's uh yeah I, I guess but i wouldn't use that word i i would use something like like a commentary or I don't know. I mean, it it to me, I guess I buy more into the absurdity of what people are capable of mm -hmm. and how random life events are in reality. Like it's totally it totally wasn't. Well, it wasn't a, a, a shift change for me when she was punching herself in the face with a hammer because she needed some she, she wanted sympathy from people. This is what psychopaths oh, yeah. do. Yeah. And then, you know, five minutes later, she's talking with this, you know, to some extent, realistic depiction of what one might call a, a low class individual that's at this motel. And to me, it's not it's not comedy. It's more like, well, this is slightly exaggerated. But you could so you could totally imagine a character like that in real life. No, So that's my. Oh, yeah, I think that's true. But I, so like the, the thing with the mallet to me, that's those are the oh shit. She's like, I, I feel like in those moments, I feel I'm watching a documentary about Ted Bundy or something, you know, like, oh, she's a psychopath. Oh, this is weird. Right. But then like there's other moments with um, like uh, Neil Patrick Harris where it's like, you know, he's acting all the super attached, uh, creepy, doofy millionaire who wants her. Right. And they play with that. And, and then there's other things like, yeah, when she comes back to his arms and and he she comes up and he's like you bitch and then you know and then she's and she's like oh you know that that stuff is or when she's being interrogated by the cops that scene is like basic instinct or something right and it's so it's so over the, that that scene would never happen like that right she never even got washed at the hospital of the, all yeah, the blood right? right so there's things like that where it there's moments that appear more to me uh, if comedy is, is is a questionable word it's definitely more over the top okay. and there's other moments where are more like oh bleak and real and I stuff see. and it, it shifts back and forth a lot and I, I i i don't know where i land if i'm being a critic but in the end the emotional feeling i get is i like it i didn't understand when she was at doogie hauser's house why she couldn't get out i mean there were just cameras well, so what's the problem? But that's like asking, why couldn't she just leave her husband instead of pretending to that? He but what was the her? threat like that he was going to tell on her or something? No, I, th I think for her, it's just that she constructs these false situations that sh that are super over the top dramatic. And then she decides that the only way to exit is this over super the top dramatic way. That's certainly true. Because I, I thought, why? OK, there's cameras, but BFD, I mean, she she is a resourceful woman she could figure out a way to get out and also frame him with something in addition to that. Why Without does she, killing him. <laughs> why does she have to kill him, yeah. you know? I mean, there's so many risks involved in, in a in a murder. I mean, you, yeah. you could get in trouble for it. There could have been other cameras that she didn't know about. He could have not died. Right. There's just so many problems with it. I was I was going along with it, particularly in the beginning, and then as she started to tell her story, I was like, okay, wow, what an elaborate hoax she pulled off that lasted for several months. I mean, the amount of like she she got a woman's pee yep. be, by emptying the toilet and having the woman pee in it, and then taking the urine out of it. But yeah, I that actually I kind of stuck on that one too because it's like how many people will pee in a toilet that has no water in it? Right. She right. would have immediately saw, oh, there's there's something wrong with this toilet, and would have. Pee I mean, I, I don't know why that sort of like right, bothered right. me, but there there were a lot of things like like that 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 that. But but for the most part, yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. I I thought it was well made, and I thought it was an original vibe that it gives off. Yeah. And an original story too, for, certainly. But I've talked to people like so. You were alluding to the the beginning. I'd be curious to say to see why that person was so upset. And I've also talked to people that didn't give away anything to me, but they told me they really disliked the last I don't know thirty percent or half of the movie or something. Yeah. Well. And the, book. There, yeah. There. There. I've read a lot of online comments, and and what a lot of people are saying is that they wish that she would have gotten her comeuppance. Oh. They wanted her to. Her, they wanted I her to see. either die or go to jail. That's that. So, that's the way most movies ends, and that that's certainly so is more simple, <laughs> more satisfying, so to speak, on a on a simplistic level. But then they haven't seen David Fincher movies. <laughs> yeah, right. Or, I mean, I know he didn't write the story, but he but, obviously gravitates. To well, like that. they haven't seen Seven or something. I mean, the or rest Fight of Club? Fight Club has a happy ending. Really? 
Absolutely. <laughs> What's the happy ending in Fight Club? He integrates the two alters of his personality. He oh. gets the girl and he destroys <laughs> capitalism. Oh, come on now. I mean, if in the in the movie moment it seems happy, but in reality the guy's face is half shot off. But he, he's with the with the But he defeated pretty... Durden. He defeated <laughs> Durden was going to kill him sure. and he defeated him. Sure. It's a so total happy he, ending. He has temporarily the social, abated the social his, network his schizophrenia. Hap, happy ending. Well, he, he's better off at the end. Well, with social networks a little more of a real, you know, retelling. even though it's completely fictitious, by but, the way. But you know what I mean. Like they can't say. Okay, can we talk about that? <laughs> I am so tired of movies being basically oh. touted as if they're reality when they're completely fictional. That's fair. It's That's so fair. bothersome. But but the, you still have some boundaries. Like at the end of Facebook, he can't say, and then Facebook blew up and turned into Google, right? Like he can't say that because we know that's not true. So there's some bounds in what he can make up, right? And so for that movie, it can't not end up with a billionaire young guy still running the company. Well, House of Cards certainly doesn't have a happy ending. Uh, the Girl with the Dragon Tattoo has a happy ending. C- curious case of Benjamin Button has a happy But see, that's funny you say happy because just because a severely abused victim finally managed to thinly escape, that's, that's not necessarily happy, right? It's just okay. <laughs> Well, okay. So whatever like, word you want to put to it, but but not not the ending of Gone well, Girl. What's what's so bad comparatively in the ending of Gone Girl? That y- you didn't feel it? You didn't feel how ugly and horrible that was? I mean, I like the ending. I think it's no, interesting. No, cuz he 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 has to live the rest of his life with a woman that tried to frame him for murder, which carries with it the death penalty, Doesn't while he has to raise a child with her. But that's the conceit of the movie. But there's many more options open to him, you know? But that's what he chooses. That's why people throw the book but that's because like, they're yeah. upset at him for sticking with him. I know, but with her. But but that's where I can't get upset at a character in a movie making a character decision that I disagree with. I can just be like, well, that's that's a shitty decision. But that's <laughs> the person that people identify with, w- women and men. On, yeah. on when I read these comments, right, most right. Of, most of them are women commenting because sure. for whatever reason, I think women are the primary audience of this book, and these women are saying that they they didn't like. Nick, they thought he was a douchebag, but they hated Amy and really wanted her to get what's coming to her. And she uh, she wins the game in the end. She gets everything she wants. She gets so... the perfect husband. She gets a child. She gets this perfect <laughs> life. And he gets, you know, it's not horrible for him, but, but it's definitely pretty... Uh, I don't know. I honestly, when you think about <laughs> like life circumstances, putting myself in his shoes, I have to say that is an awful reality. I, you but know, that's not and, what you would do. You would absolutely not what would take her into the court, to the to the criminal system, and then play your cards there. Yeah. Because what else? What else is a normal uh, or you know moral law abiding citizen going to actually do? He's not going to be like, well, I know you slashed that guy's throat, and you could do the same to me at any time. Right. And my baby. But I guess I have no choice. Right. And I think that's why people throw the book. I mean, a movie is two and a half hours of investment yep. time. Imagine reading this book over <clears throat> a number of weeks or something, and, and you're really pulling for this Nick guy to, 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 to get out of this, and you really want Amy to get her comeuppance, and then he decides to stick with her, and that's that's there's a lot of people yeah. that really hate the author. <laughs> I mean, there's these comments that's just like, how dare you write this ending? I can't believe that you would do this to me. <laughs> and that's that right there shows why they should stick to the vanilla stuff. If they can't handle something different, they shouldn't watch stuff. They should just So there should be a Disney warning over label and over. Yes. Uh, on every movie and book that says unhappy ending. Or or, or just non-standard, right? Like <laughs> because like think about if if you did that with with art or with songs, right? It's No, like, I completely agree. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, as a songwriter, I often will hear from people, "Why are all your songs so sad?" Right. And I'm and I and I don't know the answer to that question, <laughs> yeah. but I just but you have no obligation to not make them sad. <laughs> I, but it, but I also can't even. It's really hard for me to write a happy song. Sure. So it, it I don't know why that is. It just it just is. And and so yeah, I totally understand I, that. I happen to like. I'm not saying those are the only movies I like, but I like movies that end really poorly. Poorly. For example, Very Bad Things. And I know that one's more of a dark comedy, but it ends. Very poorly. Did you ever see that with uh, Cameron? No, nope, uh, never saw it. Cameron Diaz and stuff. Mm-hmm. So we should watch that one. I won't give it away. Very bad things happen. Uh, there's another dark comedy that I used to love, uh, The Last Supper, 
which was also ironically with Cameron Diaz <laughs> back when she was much younger. And they, I don't, these I don't, college I don't students, they invite people over for dinner and they have these deep conversations with them and then stuff happens. I won't say anything. Oh, else. maybe I did yeah. see it. Very dark. Does not have a good ending. Uh, shallow Grave, dark British, co- uh, dark, dark comedy. Also, no, Ethan, uh, Ian McGregor is in that one. Yeah. A so, young Ian McGregor. So, you know, like I actually, I love movies like that where it's like, no, you don't get what you want. Or like Clockwork Orange, right? Like. One of the greatest movies ever. Not a happy ending, right? Well, depending <laughs> on how you look at it, it's it's. It, I actually think that it's interesting because for Clockwork Orange, he gets his comeuppance, and and you get some satisfaction there. And then, but you're also kind of pulling for him on some level because yeah. he's the hero. And yeah. so the final scene, he goes into his fantasy world, which he gets everything he wants. Yeah. And so, to some extent, the ending gives everybody what they want. Yeah, I don't think I don't think a lot of people would see it that way though. Because I see they, it that way. Well, you do, but you like you love the movie. I love the movie, but I know people that hate the movie because they can't stand that there's so much hyper violence at that. Then the guy gets away with it, right? So it's it's one of those situations, and he doesn't get away with it per se. I mean, he he doesn't get the death penalty. Well, but. that to many people that's getting more than away with it. But he goes um, to prison. He gets reprogrammed. It's not prison, right? It's a a rehab place. Where well, he's detained yeah. involuntarily, and if they it, yeah. do psychological reprogramming. They the, the most amazing thing about that movie is that they act no special effects. Right. They actually clipped his eyelids open right, right, right. by <laughs> placing these metal hooks uh. on his on his <laughs> eyelids, lower and upper, sure. to keep his eyes completely open right <laughs> while showing him these these films in you know with the purpose of p- programming his mind to be av- averse to violence right and and it's incredible that that yeah. they did that i mean yeah. i c- you can you imagine the no. damage that would happen if you i can't even imagine yeah it's some like dedication to the cause and 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 meanwhile there's you know a technician there like Pouring putting drops, tears in yeah. his in his eyes and <laughs> it's quite a brave brave actor there i say so so you know the uh the other movie that I love that that ends uh, that uh, some people have this problem with is The Graduate because I mentioned it earlier. That one ends in this weird reality note yeah. after they seem to get away with each other. Then yeah. they're like, "Now what?" Right? Yeah. And then you realize yeah. what the fuck's going to happen. To some extent, <laughs> these non-satisfying endings are the sort of endings that make a movie a classic. Yeah. If it has this really like for for instance, I, I we'll get back to Gone Girl in yeah. a second, but just one other you know non Gone Girl movie. So you remember that movie Edge of Tomorrow that just came out recently? Oh, good memory. I loved that movie. I loved it. I was on the edge of my seat. I loved the premise. I loved the action. I, I thought it was a really good movie and underrated. Same here. But the final five, well, not five minutes, maybe the final two minutes. I thought, oh, uh-huh. they ruined it. Yeah. They changed it from a from a potential classic ending in a in a sad way, mm-hmm. but in a in a glory mm-hmm. sad sort of way, to ending in this really cheesy that doesn't make any sense happy ending sort of way. Mm-hmm. And I thought they they did that because they wanted to please the masses. There was no ultimate sacrifice in the end. Right. Okay. So just so, some little facts here. You know the woman that he that Nick has an affair with, the student. Uh-huh. That's the woman from the Robin Thicke video. That's naked. Really? Yeah. That's a blurred line. Yeah. Um. Let's see. I kind of thought this might be like the 2014 version of Fatal Attraction, which which you mentioned. Trent Reznor did the music. Did you know that? Oh, that's interesting. You know what's funny? When I watched Seven back in the day, years and years, you know, decades ago, uh, I had no idea that Trent had done the music. But as soon as the credits start, like the beginning, I'm like, oh, this has to be Trent Reznor. And sure enough, it was, right? This time, he's changed because yeah. I love the, the audio and the music, but I, I didn't even think about it's it. It's really subdued. It doesn't it sound very yeah. Trent Reznor-ish. But that's good. I mean, he's obviously expanded. Uh, Jillian Flynn wrote the screenplay as well as the novel. Oh, so, really? So, so that's the so that's part. There were a lot of rumors that the ending was going to be different. Apparently, as the movie was being made, and apparently the movie ending was very similar to, to the book. I loved it. Um, I thought that the the main message that I got from the film, or the main message I I want to get from the film, is that it compels the audience to take a side, to choose between the lesser of two evils. 
and gender is a major part of that decision. You have to choose between whether or not you're Team Nick or whether you're Team Amy. And gender is a, is a massive part of that because the story is, at least at the beginning, somewhat of a typical young couple's story. It ends in this fantastical way, but to some extent, it, it's a it's a common story for for modern Americans, for modern right. heterosexual Americans, right? Where you have them coming together in a particular way, they uh-huh. uh, they get they both get laid off on, on their jobs, and they have some stress in their marriage, and they start to bicker a little bit, and then they have to move, and then she can't find a job, and so her self esteem is starting to go down. They start to have some distance. You know, this is a very common story, right? And they they're complaining about each other, and, if, and and for the first half of the movie, a lot of the complaints that they have about each other are very mundane, yeah, very normal, and so I think it, it triggers for a lot of people, at least on the internet that I've read, th- this this commentary on American life. What uh-huh. do you think? I, that is fascinating. Um, and that makes a lot of sense because they also spend some time talking about the difference between New York and the Midwest, you know, and the, or the, what is it, Missouri? Missouri, like, I think. Like basically uh, middle of the country, you know, or big city and the difference between the rich people and the not wealthy, you know, and the difference between the male stereotypes and the female stereotypes. Right. So I do, I do see that. Um, what's funny is for me, after the first reveal where she's like driving, and we, we, the first reveal where it's like, oh, she's a psychopath. Then it became for me, it became a lot more about uh, just you know, insane versus sane. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Until yeah. the end. Right. Right. Like, <clears throat> totally. It, it, in the beginning, you're like, oh, wow, they both have their points. Right. But then at a certain point, you're like, holy crap, <laughs> she is beyond evil. Right, right, right. <laughs> so, but let, let me ask you this. During the first third of the movie or so, I can't remember how it plays out, but basically the story bits that we get about their marriage prior to her staging her own death, what do you think about his behavior? Is he a douchebag or is he not a douchebag? Or when you were right, watching the movie? Right. Um, I actually, I never got a, I mean, I don't know how we're defining douchebag, but I never got a douchey sense from him. Um, I, I just thought, I thought he wasn't very bright. You know, he came off bright in those first few scenes, like, you know, clever, witty. But then after that, they, they down, maybe they purposely downplayed that or something. He didn't, I'm not saying he was like dull, but he certainly wasn't like a genius, you know? And and then there was this very artificial shift between he never saw it coming. To then, oh yeah, no, that's her. Oh, she manipulated this whole thing and she invented all. It's like, wow, that's a quick shift because right. he either sus- should have suspected crazy shit like that, or if he didn't, because she's that psychopath that she's that good about it. Then when he's s- the shocking realization of what's really transpired, right. I I would have imagined him to be more devastated. So in the end, I just kind of saw him as a normal dude. <laughs> And so that's interesting because I had a similar reaction, and I have to say, as a man, we might have s- some bias. <laughs> yeah, and sure. problematic bias because as I read comments on the internet from women talking about the Nick character, they pointed out some things, and then I started thinking back, and I started thinking, yeah, why, why, why didn't I pick up on that? Because when you start looking, oh, and by the way, before you tell me, because I. I I'll, I'll throw this out to see how it compares to what you what you'll say. Uh, we should remember that many of the things we learn about him are not real because she made them up in her diary. Right. That we should just keep that in mind. Right. right. So <laughs> it's hard to say what's right. real and what's not right. real. Right. But for instance, he's well. Tell me. Well, maybe you can help me out with this because I uh-huh. I, I wasn't really when I was watching the movie. I wasn't trying to catalog things because I didn't right. know I was going to be doing a podcast about right. it. But when he had sex, remember there's a scene where he has he's having sex with her from behind and uh-huh. he finishes and then just walks he right. just walks off yep. and like says hey i think we're gonna watch the game tonight right. you know and she's like okay and she's clearly not happy with right. the situation was that her recollection or did that that's tough because that was in her diary oh it was but a lot of real things were in her diary too right and there who's to say if he's having an affair and he's really dissatisfied Maybe that did happen, yeah. right? So that one's kind of hard. That's why, and I think that's great because it makes it hard to tell. That because I asked, I assumed he he uh, pushed her down when when we first see that scene. 
Right. I assumed that was real. Yeah. And then you're like, oh, wait, she made that up. But and she says as she starts her her uh, exposition narrative, she starts saying, you know, and I made it sound like this. And, that. and they show the alternate scenes where he's not really that shitty and playing video games all the time and being that lame. But he is still having an affair right. and he is still kind of detached and he is, you know. Right. Huh. But he, so we yeah. don't know because because of the things that I can point to that I could say he's a douchebag, maybe some of them or all of them might have been lies that she was putting in the diary. Maybe. Is that what you're saying? Kind of what I'm saying, unless unless we're ready to conclude, which I'm not by, hey, well, he was having an affair. Therefore, he's a douchebag. Case closed. No, right. there are a lot of yeah. I mean, it's a douchebag thing to do to have an affair. Yes. To lie to your partner and sneak around is a douchebag thing to do. No question. The question is, what else? Was he also right. a douchebag because of... <laughs> right, yeah, because there was that other thing where in the diary she was saying that she wanted to have a kid and he didn't, but then he comes around it's and a, says he wanted to right. have a kid and right. she didn't. So that that's a great example. So I can imagine, and maybe I'm being uh, biased here or whatever, but I can imagine uh, a female watching the movie, seeing that scene where she's like, I want a kid, or I forget how it goes, and then he goes like, like this is the worst time, whatever, right? I could see that being like, oh, what a jerk or whatever, right? That was not a real scene. He actually was the one who wanted the kid, and she was like, I can't right. have you. I don't want to have kids. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, so it's hard to it is know. Hard to... Uh, the, well, well, okay, well, let me tell you what we do know, f- factually, so to speak, that both of them confirm, is that he was talking shit about her for a long time to everyone around him. Yep. You know, on the morning, especially that, his sister. Yeah, yeah. in the morning, he dis- she disappears. He's talking with his twin. It took me a while to figure out who she was. I for right. for the first little bit, I thought his twin sister was like his lover or something because right, right, I, I was like. But anyway, she, you know, she's like, oh, that bitch again, you know. Yeah. And so clearly, he's you know talking a lot of crap about her. But oh. it's it, it seemed to me that she had her own idea. That she had made up her own mind that she was a bitch as well. Like it, it felt like she had enough stories. They hinted a few times that like, oh, the bitch and stuff like that. Right. It feel like she had gotten burned by her enough right. or something. Right. And then we find out that prior to Nick, she was in a relationship with another guy. She lied and said that he raped her, right? Mm-hmm. And then got him convicted of rape. Well, they they had a plea bargain down yeah, yeah. to like sexual ruin his life. Yeah, completely ruined his life. Yeah, he can't get a yeah. job. No one will date him because he's on websites as a sexual, uh, what do they call it? Uh, predator, offender, offender, sexual yes. offender. Yeah, they did establish that she she didn't just become a psych. In fact, she in her narrative, she says, like, you know, I'm, I made myself who I needed to be to attract him and blah, 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 blah. Right? Yeah. She, she is clearly a sh- shape shifter. So we also know factually that both of them confirm is that he did not care when she disappeared. I mean, he comes home, the door's open, the cat's outside, he walks into the living room, uh, an ottoman is flipped over, and the glass table is is shattered, and he just just doesn't seem to care. He doesn't call her parents. He He, does go, Amy, but, you know, whatever. Or what's her name? But imagine this was you. Oh, no, no, of course. You come home, you expect her to be there, the car's in the garage, that kind of thing, and... And you see this violence. Yeah, you there. see a broken table. The door's open. And the door's wide open? I mean... Oh, it's over. I would I would come apart. I would lose my shit. <laughs> he walks in. He seems to not care at all. Right. He calls the police. The police show up. He doesn't seem to care while he's walking them around the house. Now, the, the one thing that... At that moment in the movie, I had a couple thoughts. One was that this is not... He's not handling this very realistically... But then I thought, oh, unless he did it. But then I thought, I don't think he did it. So is this just bad script? But then what's great is that a little later, we, we find out that even without them knowing that she's capable of such level of ridiculous deceit, uh, his sister makes a comment like, it's just like her to, to get into some kind of trouble like this. Like, you know, they talk flippantly about it. Oh, right. Which leads me to believe that there's many things. A lot of drama. That she probably got herself into right. that weren't as psychotic or whatever as what she actually did. Right. But- that where they were like, gee, and that's probably why she's like, well, she's, she's a bitch, and why he's like, yeah, you know her. Oh right, I forgot about that. You know, so yeah, they're they're saying, oh, I'm sure she got into another one of her things again. And, yeah, and so, <laughs> which is like what thing? Yeah, what kind of things <laughs> would happen where you would come home, the doors wide open, <laughs> the tables busted, and and uh, and your wife is missing, you know? 
but but the other thing is 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 that I think at that point he he hated her. And when you hate someone, it's hard to right. feel a lot of worry and empathy. Yeah, you know, there was probably a part of him that that might have wished she got abducted and killed. Right. Right. Like I, I, I really liked how they did the scenes where because he really was mopey and moping around and in the press conference and he looks like shit and they're like take a picture and he's like he looks like ninety percent of the moments where he's standing next to his picture her picture he looks like crap and then at the last second he's he gives a half smile and that's the one they run with and <laughs> yeah, and that's yeah. actually that was a good moment because yeah. and I knew that would happen and then the, I thought the groupie thing was a little weird because it was a little yeah. too contrived right yeah. she comes out she's super friendly to him she takes the selfie. And then she's like, you weirdo. I was like, come on. Okay. Yeah. You're a little far, but. Right. Most people in that situation would have been like, oh, okay. I'll, yeah. I'll erase it. And then you do have to question like, well, why did he even go with it in the first? So he's clearly, he's clearly like a little bit of a sum, you know, like yeah. he, he should know better. Right. right. He, it, it, whatever. And the, well, and the fact that he's like, yeah, like he's still relating to his affair, the, the girl in the midst of this situation and has sex with her yeah. at his sister's place. Yeah. Has her sleep. Oh, I mean, yeah. clearly the guy, that's what I was saying. Like, but the way that it was directed <laughs> and written in that scene, they almost, you, they almost make you want to sympathize with him yes, yes. because he's like, no, not here. We yes, can't do here. Yes, and yes. she, and she's really pressuring him right, right. and she starts getting naked right? and he, you know, and he's like, no, no, no. And then, yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, I, I think, if I were directing, I would have totally screwed up the movie. But if I, if I would have done one thing different, I would have had him be more on board with that because that would have made it perhaps more realistic, not realistic, yep. but, but more like in line with the idea of there's two sides of this story, you know? I didn't, one thing I didn't like, and I don't know if it's the same in the book, um, I was really enjoying the female detective up until the point where they opened the garage on a random anonymous tip and they find perfectly stacked and in their boxes all the things he quote unquote bought for himself right and then they arrest him and it's like right uh, i mean come on like i think there was another piece of evidence though, well no too. they found they found the gift with the mallet missing and things right. like that but but he even says like because okay, they're looking at the diary and the end line is like i think he might kill me and he's like well that's a convenient and like yeah. and she was so discerning before that and so questioning she and she was even already starting to say well this is a little very too perfect yeah and there's clues left you know it's all this stuff and then she quickly forgets all that right. and she turns into well the other thing i mean tell me if this is a plot hole why didn't they empty that shed they because nick and go his twin margo found this the shed before the cops found it so they could have easily disposed of all that oh stuff. why didn't uh they why didn't ben affleck do that yeah why didn't nick <laughs> why didn't nick get rid of this stuff because yeah. that's incriminating evidence i mean yeah. all you got to do is pack that stuff in a car and take it to a landfill yep and but he didn't he just left it there perfectly stacked uh, I also got confused a little bit, but then then I guess I realized what it was. When he first contacted the lawyer and they started like talking to the ex boyfriend and they started building a case, I was thinking like, and then they were gonna go to the press with all this or something. And but then and the cops, right? But instead they didn't mention any of it or anything. So then I was like really confused. But then I realized, oh, I guess that is that how it works? They just have to bring it up at trial or something. I I don't know. It was a little weird because I thought, okay, now they can go to the cops and be like, look, talk to this guy. Like, right. what do you think of Tyler Perry? Was that Tyler Perry? Yeah. No way. The lawyer's Tyler Medea? Perry. Yeah. Holy crap. He was great. He was really I've good. I've never seen him in things. He, I've never seen a Tyler Perry very movie. very enjoyable. Either. Some people, they live by Tyler Perry movies. I've never seen one. I just, because I thought that all he did was those movies like the- He does. Eddie Murphy movies with the- That's big, what he does. But okay. so this is a really different role for him. Wow. I liked him a lot. Yeah. I thought he was really great. Um, okay. So let's talk oh. about Amy. Oh, Amy. Okay. So yes. So she had done terrible things to three men. We know that. So oh, what was what was the terrible thing she did to to Doogie though? She killed him. Oh no no okay, but she hadn't done that yet. No, but by the by end of the, the movie, of the, she yes. kills. Him. <laughs> that is pretty bad. <laughs> I mean, she fakes <laughs> yeah. she fakes him raping her her and then slits his throat while he's on top of her and yeah. the blood flows down on her body. Yeah. Apparently that's not in the book. Apparently in the book, she just drugs him. He passes out and then she slits his throat. I see. But in the, in the movie, it's they, a little had, more dramatic. they made it more. So, okay, let's diagnose Amy. Let's, let's look at the facts here. Okay. She did terrible things to three men. 
one you know one man sort of deserved it. Doogie Howser sort of deserved it. Did he? Yeah, I mean, it's implied that in the story that there was no way for her to get away. There was no oh, way for her to get out. That he I didn't get this sense at all. That's what people are saying on the internet that okay, that he I, that she does that she it was okay for her to do right. something to him. Here's 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 my theory about eighty percent of the people. <laughs> they take things too literally. They don't have enough capacity for abstraction. That's my feeling because because like yes, obviously the guy is obsessed and probably a little dangerous in the right situation. But as you pointed out. It, she is so resourceful. Getting away from this place would not have been difficult. There were windows everywhere. Um, the second part of it is he actually only implied, didn't actually ever threaten or say that she was stuck there or anything like that. So we don't even know if that was even real. Like, we don't even know if, if she was really in prison, right? Yeah. Uh, third, the, um, <laughs> the thing is that she, uh, she called him, right, for help. And she she basically, like, had been stringing him along all these years, knowing that he's obviously a little weird, right? Yeah, he's a stalker. Yeah, but all we know about him, we know f- from her. Right. And she's the single most unreliable narrator now that we have. Right. So in the end, is he a little weird? Yes, but clearly he's been able to also function in other ways because he's, you know, he studied a lot, he's blah, blah, blah. But it doesn't mean he's not weird and potentially dangerous. That's true. Uh, nowhere near as dangerous as her. <laughs> I actually thought, Doogie Howser did it for a while. At, at, yeah, at the they made it seem that way. That's yeah, true. Yeah, right? They and he shows up to the thing. And... Right, right. So, okay, so there's the debatable thing there. And maybe in the book it's more clear. I don't know. But certainly a lot of people on the internet think he deserved it. Clearly. <laughs> that's, that's insane. There's, she's a psychopath. It's like it's like watching the Ted Bundy making of movie or whatever. Well, well we're going to get to that in a second. So hold on okay, to that. Hold right. on to that anger. Okay. Hold on to that anger, all right. my, all my, right. my friend. Okay, another person did totally did not deserve it. Clearly, Nick did not deserve it at all. No, I mean, there's so many other options that yes. she, she could have done. She could have divorced. Yes, she could have had an affair. A billion things. She could have punched him in the face. Absolutely. But to frame him for murder in a state where the death penalty would have killed him. Wow. Okay, and then the other guy we don't know. Although from the movie, no, no. It, <laughs> it seemed like he was yeah. an innocent person yeah. that she framed. Yeah. Uh, with a sexual assault, but we don't really know. It's hard hard to say. Could be lying, I suppose. But now, <laughs> hard to say. We've seen how psycho she is. Yeah. So we also saw that she manipulated several people for months and seemed to enjoy the process. When she was watching the story unfold on the news after her disappearance, she was riveted to the TV. She loved it. Whenever oh, yeah. that, whenever the TV was oh, yeah. on. She she almost blew her cover a couple times because she was glued. She to was the, nearly orgasming, <laughs> right? Because it was she was like, yes, yes, I'm getting it. Everyone loves me, and I'm getting attention. And now yes. my husband is being yes. framed for murder, and and I'm this I'm this awesome person. And well, he, and everyone sh- hates and they him. showed those scenes where she was plotting how to befriend her neighbor and thinking, right? Here is this idiot, and I can totally manipulate her and all these things, right? Right. And then writing the diary and manipulating the the police. Imagine that, just that act. It's that's that's seven ish. Right. S- the the dedication to sit there and write a whole fake fucking diary of years yeah. of stuff. Yeah. And then just so you can plant it, so you can frame your. I mean, that's a lot of effort. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, another thing is just a tiny note here is she and him they had sex in the library when they were still dating. That's right, and they were they were still in love with each other or whatever they were with each other. This is a disregard for social norms. So it's just a data point of someone that right. doesn't care necessarily for social norms. Oh, you mean because you got to be quiet in the library? <laughs> yeah. So uh, she stole his sperm and got pregnant to manipulate Nick into staying with her. That's quite an quite an action. I That's mean. Right. Not only are you manipulating your husband who hates you with a passion, but now you're involving a child in this relationship. All because you... Stop. Sorry, the cat's attacking both. Well, if you move it. And there we go. It was stuck in her mouth. Okay. <laughs> um, she seemingly had no remorse for any of her actions. She was never apologetic. No, in fact, the only signals of emotional content that you got from her other than at the first at the beginning of the movie you thought she had emotions right but later when it's she's been revealed i only saw uh maybe three things one of them was doubt or uh, indecision or uh i don't know what the right word is but definitely indecision about killing herself right Mm -hmm. like maybe 
fear or maybe lack of accomplishment or something. There was some feeling there. The second one was uh, uh, she certainly have, she certainly had feelings of uh, disgust or uh, like she she looked down on people a lot, right? And then the the other one was she she had this one moment of fear when she was being attacked by those two people. And I felt that that was genuine. Right now, th- maybe there's a fourth one. Do you remember when she slices his throat and stuff? For a second, she like she has this like ah look in her face. I couldn't tell if that was her rehearsing or that her really freaking out a bit or not. Huh. But anyway, so she shows. But there are these very like traces of feeling. Everything else is like she's a robot. Okay, so a lack of emotion. Yeah, that's another observation we can say. She didn't care that everyone close to her was terrified and her disappearance. About about her disappearance and probable death. She didn't seem to care at all. She seemed to have no remorse that she was putting her family and her husband and the entire community through this whole song and dance. She just did not care. Do, do you get the sense that, uh, although it's, it was probably genetic as well, but she, I got the sense that because of her childhood where she was this fictional character that, right. that, she knew that wasn't her and this fictional character was doing all these things that maybe she dissociated a bit through that process or something like that. Yeah. Well, let's get into that in a little bit. She also in personally used sex to manipulate people, which is something to say, right? Yep. She, she used sex to manipulate the boyfriend before Nick to get him convicted of rape. She used sex with Neil Patrick Harris to get him to, you know, she used sex in a particular way that that for, so we say, normal people, they would not be able to do that, even if they right. thought, oh, I'm going to frame this guy to rape me. <laughs> yeah. They they couldn't go through with it because sex for most people is too personal. It's it, it, it's too it's too far to go. Right. For somebody. Um So let's see. Uh, And another, my last observation here along these lines is she was extremely charming, extremely charming, and she easily manipulated other people. Yeah, when she wanted to be, yep. Right. When she wanted to manipulate, she could do it without any problem, and she could do it very easily. This is a particular kind of person because they don't have the normal remorse that will kick in and prevent the person from being able to effectively manipulate. Like a, a normal person, right. when they have that, you know, impulse, or when she was, especially with that friend down the street, yep. she w- she was hanging out with her for the sole purpose of yes. manipulating that and situation. pretending the whole time. Right, the whole time. She befriended her. Imagine on- the energy involved. Right. In that deception. Right. For most normal people, the, that amount of energy to overcome your remorse and your instinct to be a good human being would be so great yeah. that you wouldn't be able to pull it off. And be on character the whole time. And do it so well. Yep. Right. She did that without any problem. Yep. There was, there, it was like she was just reaching into the fridge and grabbing She's something. Like, That's my best friend. Right. She made this 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 woman <laughs> feel as though Amy was her best friend. Yep. She, they they confided in you know Amy told her about her evil husband yes. and told you know planted all of these these lies. This is a an odd set of behaviors we're looking yes. at, right? Um, another thing that another so so all of these are indicative of psychopathy or narcissism depending on how you want to define it. So, and we'll get into more of that. Well, let, let's get into that now. So things like having superficial charm is, is uh, an aspect of psychopathy. Having a, a grandiose sense of self-worth. I deserve to have the entire world upended by me being dead or missing, that kind of thing. Pathological lying, again, because you lack remorse. You don't care. It right. doesn't bother you to lie to someone's face. And also that manipulation, again, to get what you want from other people. You, you have no problem manipulating other right. people to get that. Also, a lack of remorse, emotionally shallow that you pointed out, not a lot of emotion. I mean, if she, if she wasn't what we would call a psychopath, she would have been busted up. You know, She yeah. would have been nervous. She would have been sad. She would have been ambivalent. She would have uh, eventually, maybe at the end, told Nick, you know, I, I don't know how this got out of control and I'm yeah. really sorry and, you know, let's just move our separate ways or something. Right. The yeah. only ambivalence for her seemed to be about, A, whether or not to kill herself and, B, to the ambivalence of 
how oh is this the outcome i want or do i want more attention Ooh. Oh, I feel like I could get even more attention, you know, that right. ambivalence. Right, because she got that second wave yes. of attention by having the redemption of their marriage. That's right. Well, my my hypothesis is that she never intended to kill herself. That was part of her plan that she had <laughs> right. on her calendar, but she, I don't think she actually ever intended really to kill herself. I think that was part of her fantasy. You know, I think she had that's the story in her head. She's like, okay, I'll frame it for murder. I'll do all these things. I'll watch the media for a little bit, and then I'll kill myself to really make sure he gets he gets what's yeah. coming to him. <laughs> but then, as as the attention starts to roll in, right. she's like, "Oh, why would I kill myself in the in the midst of all this media attention?" And I feel that maybe where the narcissism plays in too, which is that right. I surely I'm not gonna really kill myself, right? You know, and and uh, the other thing that was interesting is when that scene first started, when the the rev- the first reveal, and she's the short driving. At that moment, I still assumed that he, he really had hit her and he really was not a good guy. So I thought it was a, I thought that reveal moment was a her getting him back. Right. And I thought, well, that's extreme. Yeah. yeah. But okay, you go girl. Yeah. But yeah. then a, a few moments into that reveal, you realize, oh, oh, Whoa. oh shit. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, you're not good. Right. At all. <laughs> that's, that's what I think the beauty of the book and the movie is, is that it makes you, really shift your yeah. loyalties. Right. And that's what I said the main point is, is is that it you're you're forced to decide who you like more. Yeah. And it's a it's a very gray area, I think. It's just as brilliant as you pointed out as Twilight, where you also have to pick sides. Between team team Ed, Edward and team what's the other guy? The teen Wolf guy. <laughs> teen Wolf guy. Um okay, so another thing is that uh, another aspect of psychopathy in this in this factor is the failure to accept responsibility for your behavior. So that's clearly what she that clearly describes her. You know, she she did not take responsibility for what she had done, even interpersonally with her husband, whom knew the whole story. I mean, Nick knew everything. He he knew everything she right, did. Right. He knew all of the evil that she perpetrated. And was the victim of all that perpetration. Right. And she just didn't care. She's like, well, not only do you have to live with that now, but I'm going to force you to marry me. Yeah. So let's just move forward with this. Let's just be, listen, I'm not going to hurt you. Just, we can move forward. Right. This. So a whole other set of criteria for the psychopathy diagnosis are the following. So it's things like impulsivity and irresponsibility or poor behavioral controls, these kinds of things. Juvenile delinquency, this kind of stuff. And she didn't have any of those signs, it seemed. Well, I don't know, right? Because she, she uh, remember, I uh, remember getting away with you to the lake and skipping school or whatever. Um, she seemed like when she was younger, she was probably just as reckless. And maybe. And, you know, like, we don't know. Like, she was a child of privilege with this weird, like, media attention already when she was young. But usually what, what this factor involves are things like, and well, and maybe, you know, maybe they left all that out because in those stories that the twins are talking about, like, oh, remember that? And maybe because she, in what we saw, I didn't see any impulsivity. It was all planned in advance. There was what what typical psychopaths will do normally for, for those that fit all the criteria is they will act out of emotion because it's what they want. You know, it's out of a narcissistic, this is what I want and I deserve it and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. You know, uh, certainly you would not say she was impulsive. She was the opposite of impulsive. She had the ability to put off gratification <laughs> for months while she went through a lot of difficult steps to get what she wanted. So would you say, but, but there are these, there are these cases or are they more psychotic? I mean, like there's these cases of psychopathic, people like, not psychotic. Well, that's why I'm asking though, because you were just saying that, you know, in most cases, the psychopaths are very impulsive and things like that. And I was thinking, yeah, but what about like, there are cases like Dahmer and things like that where they, I mean, I don't, I don't want to say planning, but they do plan. They plan around how to get their victims and how to store everything. And, it's been a long time since I watched and read about him, but what I do know is that he was, uh, as you, uh, unlike Ted Bundy and and most other psychopaths, I guess, uh, he didn't necessarily fit the. Uh, uh, oh, he's so outgoing. He's like you know really charming profile. It was more like oh, he's a nice, quiet guy. So not everyone fits all the criteria, sure. 
of the psychopathy. And just as a side note here, the diagnosis of psychopathy is just an effort by us yeah. to categorize a, what we would call a group of people that, that do horrible things. And, and what a lot of people believe, and I believe too, is that it's impossible to categorize these things, you know? So, so you know, we could just as easily say Jeffrey Dahmer is an N of one for this one particular disorder that looks just like what he said right. or what he did. So I, I guess I'm wondering if the, the seven movie psychopath can exist because that requires such discipline and, right. and patience. So that's the thing is, is, is often what will accompany the, the capacity to do horrible things is impulsivity and the inability to behave according to your goals inability to control your behavior because you don't care you're just you're just you just act because it's what you want and then that's what gets you in trouble right. rather than a long yeah, series yeah, yeah. of of planned well planned murders you know the 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 amys of the world are, are very rare yeah whereas the guy who gets in a bar fight every night and ends up in prison is very common actually you know what that does that does make sense because there's a difference between the craft and the creativity and planning around hiding the evidence or one you know because like Dahmer just like all, all the other ones it was more like oh he would see someone get very attracted to them and want to overtake them and possess them uh, which is kind of impulsive right right and uh definitely when you read the Ted Bundy stuff and all that he, he was the, he was super impulsive. Right. Yeah. <laughs> he escapes from prison and then goes on another killing spree. Yeah. It's 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 clinical. With, without without staking out. Yeah. He go he wa- walks into a sorority and kills two yes. girls and a, and John Wayne Gacy. All those guys. They're like opport- opportunistic, right. just impulsive. Yeah. That makes sense. Right. So some research says that when women fit the psychopathy psych- diagnosis, they're more like the Amys of the world where. They have that superficial charm and the lying and the manipulation, the, the lack of remorse, the emotional uh, shallowness, those kinds of things, and not the kinds of things that you'll see in men, which is more of the bar fighting and the criminal activity and the yelling at people and the uh, difficulty controlling your behavior. So, so some research says that uh, there's a gender difference among psychopaths. I see. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So, so I would say she definitely fits the criteria for for psychopathy. She she could also fit the criteria uh, in addition to psychopathy of borderline and or narcissistic personality disorder and or antisocial. I won't go into that right now. But the borderline aspect of her was that she had evidence that she was really into Nick in the beginning. You know, she yep. she, she she really fell in love with him. She really wanted to be with him, and then. At a certain point, she made a switch, and the switch was very harsh. Yes. She went from, you know, I love him, and I want to have this perfect marriage where we're a perfect couple, to I want him to be erased off the face of this planet in this very disgraceful, horrible way. Right. I mean, because you think about it, she could have killed him. Right. She could have just killed him. I mean, think of how smart she was. She could have easily killed him and gotten away with it, right. but she didn't want that. She wanted him disgraced. Right. She didn't want him gone. She wanted to do something to him. And so so she goes through all that with the premise that she's she's over him. She's moving on in life. She's done with him. Right. And then she switches back when she sees that interview and where it, he's right. where he's lying. Right. He he's lying and saying he wants her back and right. he loves her. But be but because people with borderline, as we call borderline, are so desperate for closeness even if it's fake, they will gravitate towards that in a self-destructive manner. And she did this, that. She she yeah. she totally went, you know, 110% back into yeah. his arms and manipulated everyone once again so that she would be in this, quote-unquote, perfect marriage with him. And that, that, by the way, I think that's where it is proof of extreme impulsivity. So maybe for the purpose of the book and the movie, they show her crafty planning and all these things. But in the end, She's super impulsive, right? Because she throws away her whole crafty plan, 
but but let me t- let me let me tell you what clinically impulsive would have looked like uh-huh. when she saw it she would have run out the door or called him she would have called him or run out the door and ran into his arm she didn't do that she she figured out a way to make it so that she could kill I see. NPH and manipulate the media in a very showy way so that not only can she get Nick back but also have a child and also have the media love them as a couple you know so that was not impulsive I see. you know that's just that's just it's a potato potato to some All extent right. but but by my s- definition yeah. it's impulsive yeah <laughs> but i see what you're saying <laughs> um yeah, like by my standards, I don't usually wake up and say, you know what, I'm going to, I think I'm going to plant, oh, you know, I'm going to get filmed by this camera getting kind of raped and then I'm going to go slice someone's head. Yeah. But you're right that the that didn't all happen at once. It required planning. And right. Things. Yeah. Quite a bit of planning. She staged that pseudo rape thing where yeah. she put the wine on her, yeah. on her, you know. She did, yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I just want to say as a caveat to what I was saying is that I don't believe that borderline people are typically like Amy. You know, uh, I've treated a lot of people that one might diagnose with borderline. And I'll say that they're almost never, in fact, they probably have the, the same risk of her harming another person in this way that someone without borderline would mm-hmm. have. So it's not as if borderline people are right. typically like that. But but the but borderline again what we call borderline it's it's not an actual thing it's just a descriptive word that we put to a set of observed behaviors or endorsed uh, criteria. The people that we describe as borderline, they're 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 either a hundred percent into you or they're a hundred percent not into you. Right. <laughs> and and she certainly had that had that quality. Also, they can often be suicidal, and she had suicidal thoughts as yeah. well you're right maybe that wasn't really suicidal thoughts because it was like was it just it was just part of her act in a way you know i mean i know it was she, well, she really had it on her depressed but she had it on her private calendar yeah but she, yeah she certainly didn't seem depressed yeah, yeah. but I, yeah i think it was a kind of a fantasy yeah so let's go to the internet reaction and I, i'm guessing you haven't read it because, no i have not because you I literally to, just watched yeah because if you did you would have probably toned down some of the some of the pro man talk because if 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 our listeners are any representative of the internet they're not going to like some of the things that you said <laughs> nice <laughs> um so uh, the first stuff i read on the internet was a lot of women writers seemingly defending amy <laughs> and they were saying things like she's a feminist like for instance oh my like this God. is a, this is this is a quote a feminist psychopath Against a misogynist jerk. Oh, Listen. whoa! This is and let me let me read and and I'm I'm a little I I don't know I'm sort of on the fence about this but oh, anyway God. let me let me read uh, some quotes here. Gone Girl is the most feminist mainstream movie in years. So I just want to repeat that. Gone Girl is the most feminist mainstream movie in years. A forthright depiction of the ways that society controls women and forces them into certain roles, then lets men basically do whatever they want. Amy Amy Dunn might be a monster, but she's no psychopath. No, she's Frankenstein's monster, stitched together by a husband, parents, and a social order oh that that demanded God. she be certain things rather than who she really was. What do you think? <laughs> no, no, you know what? I I see their point. Uh, what was the guy we did? Elliot Ro- uh, Roger. Elliot Roger. He he might be a monster, but he certainly he certainly is not like uh, whatever you would diagnose him with because. Uh, he was just a product of his environment. And Ted Bundy, in the end, was not a psychopath. He was just, you know, the, his mom didn't understand him. And his girlfriends were probably too nice to him, you know? So so I was having a similar reaction to you when I read that. Um, and, and by, and, the, way, and by was, the way, by the way, Hitler, not a bad guy. And I was worried that this whole thing was going to become a man versus woman thing. Like the Elliot Rogers story right. became this man versus woman thing on the Internet, which I find really weird, <sighs> weird, weird these days. It's it's like why does it have to become just about that? Yep. I mean, not that. So so I was like, oh god, here are the women saying that it's a feminist m- movie and book, and now we're gonna hear the backlash. And I didn't find any, but I'm sure there is of men saying, how dare you? Basically saying what you're saying. And I also find it weird that that it would be called feminist in the sense that I guess if their point is that because you know, she's not an empowered woman. I, I mean, if you want to call 
being able to kill people being empowered. I don't, right? But right. she's not an empowered woman. She actually doesn't know what how to pursue her own happiness, her own self-fulfillment, has no discernible real goals for self other than live through whoever she's with right. until she's done with them, right? And and then use people, right? right? So if that's the aspiration of a feminist of a feminist movement, that would be disastrous. I know. But if on the other hand, uh, we're saying that, well, no, 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 what, what this is showing is that this is what women are driven to by the evils of men in society. Well, then I still go like, well, how many, so are we saying that statistically speaking, lots of women murder and fake their own abductions and all these things? Like how often does that actually happen? Right. It, so, it, right. So, yeah. Um, now, the the thing that I can't agree with about saying that it's feminist is I, I understand some of the arguments that it is a feminist movie in that it portrays a woman in a leading role as a complex, dark character with her own set of motivations rather than a one-dimensional damsel in distress sort of character. You know what I mean? I do, but I have... Because this movie would not have been made like in the 50s or something. It wouldn't have been made in that way. You know what? I actually, I'm going to stand on this one. No, I actually think this movie... If, if I were being this way, I think this movie is very anti-women because if you think about all the female characters in this movie, you have the young, manipulating bimbo girl out to ruin a marriage. You have the sister who's not even in a relationship who only lives for her brother, so has no other real role in life. Right. You have the one girl who seems empowered, the one woman who seems empowered is the psychopath killer. Right. The mom is a manipulating, you know, uh, overbearing person. Yeah. Where is the, oh, and then you have the cop. The cop who's like kind of more of a tomboy who's really, you know, again, failed marriage and also flip flops on a win. And like, so who is- But she's the, kind of a hero. Sort of, in the end, what did she do? She couldn't even go after the, she knows she's guilty. Yeah. But she, she tried. She tried. How did she try? But the I, men, just, there's nothing the men, can, the men oppress. The men, well, the men FBI kept her down. It's in my in but my. But anyway, movie, I, yeah, you're right. There's no good female, strong, real well character. But here's here's what the internet is saying along these lines: is they're saying that's the way that that's like okay. So maybe maybe I could say there's like different phases of of feminism becoming infused into movies. So you have the damsel in distress where the woman is only there to serve as a prop for the man's he her heroism, right? Yep. And then you have the second phase when you're trying to move away from that, where you have women that are perfect. They're, they're like um, Thelma and Louise kind of thing, where they have no flaws and they're putting up with all this BS and they're 100% they're wonderful and, and don't have any dark side. And then you have this, this third phase, which is you have a woman in a in a movie that's interesting because she was definitely interesting and complex and you're definitely wanting to know what she's going to do next and she's horrible <laughs> and 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 so whereas if we re, if we go back in time to phase 1 you wouldn't have that character cuz no writer would dedicate so much you know, screen time to to a woman to flesh out her character. Does that make sense? Yeah, but imagine if you had done this with with uh, the with black people, like well, let know, me give you an a example. Black leading role well, who's a murderer. It's it's the same thing, and I I agree. What you're saying that that would demonstrate the opposite, but I'm saying it demonstrates my point here. As an Asian person, uh -huh. I grew up with Asians being in movies that were extremely offensive. Yep. But on some level, like with Long Duck Dong, for instance, in 16 yeah. Counts. But when I was a kid, I was just happy to see an Asian in a movie, even though it's a Japanese guy playing some Korean. Yeah, but that's the, that's the mark of the abused, right? That right. That you're just happy to. Right. Right. So then the next phase, you you know, when, when you start seeing Asians like John Cho and Harold and Kumar, where he's just a guy and his Asianness isn't really called upon very much. Yeah. Then, then I'm even more happy. So, but if we go back in time, we have uh, what was his face that played in um, Breakfast at Tiffany's? Uh, oh yeah, yeah, he yeah. Just, yeah. He, uh, just, he, yeah. Just, he just died recently. Mickey Rooney. Mickey Rooney playing a Japanese. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. so, so. No, but 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 the thing is, like, we've moved so far beyond. Probably fifty years beyond the point where we've had wonderful female leading actresses in great dramatic roles like that. We don't have to go back. No, I'm saying. <laughs> well, but what they're saying is that 
this is going further down the road where you have uh, <laughs> the role of a woman expanded. And, isn't and we, that basic instinct then? Well, basic instinct was a little an, different an in empowered that empowered woman who can manipulate people and but, kill. But them. look at the character in in Basic Instinct and the character of of Amy. Yeah, Amy very Amy is similar. Is similar, but I would say that Amy's character has more facets than the Basic Instinct. Uh, character. It's a better. It is a better movie, and it is a better developed right. character. Set. So, but he, here's here's my here's my other hypothesis as to why a lot of people on the internet. These are people with their own columns. You know what I mean? Like they write for a living. These aren't just like some random person on YouTube or something. Well, um, not that the two are necessarily <laughs> that different, but for, for us men, okay, you and I, our entire life, we have been titillated with characters doing awesome things, you know? You got Arnold Schwarzenegger just mowing down people in like revenge movies, like uh, Charles Bronson getting back at the gangs and, and just, you know, Luke Skywalker and Han Solo. And, you know, we just have like, the list just goes on and on and on of these characters. Noble characters. Okay. Or, or even evil characters like, um, like well, anti heroes. Uh, anti heroes. Where, where they're not evil. Where they, where they're anti heroes, where they do horrible things or they're more ambivalent. And us men, we get to have a lot of our, uh, suppressed desires titillated and satisfied through these characters. I think that's one of the main reasons why people go to movies is because we identify with certain characters right. and then, so then you they get, get to do things that, that yeah. we never get to do. So so kill Bill. Great. Okay. So 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 right. that's that's one opportunity. Right. But but when a when an opportunity like this comes along in a movie, which is quite rare, we can agree. Yes. Where there's a woman that kicks some serious ass, then the I f- think the women that are watching it get the same kick out of it that we get uh, so and and but they're so thirsty for it <laughs> because they're they're so rarely given that in comparison but, to but men. see i would that, never that, say that they say that that they walk out of the movie and go finally someone's thinking about me and my and my needs well but how would how would women or any of us feel if men walked out of seeing a ted bundy movie said finally he was kicking some ass <laughs> right like right that would be monstrous yeah like but but we say but it, it could be an indication of how thirsty they are well, that's a scary thirst if that were true. I, true. I, I just, like, if this was a movie where she is like, I mean, like, why, you know, Contact, the movie uh, didn't do a service to, to, to a female message, but the book did, because in the book, she is a super empowered, scientific, modern, all with herself woman who figures out, and she's the leading uh, person who figures out all the things in the book. In the movie, she, she was more there when, when everyone else is kind of figuring things out. But, um, but in the book, it was really good, right? That to me is like, that's an amazing thing. Like you don't get a lot of those. Like where, you know, if, if you do, if you have a movie where there's a female scientist, it's like freaking Bond where she's a cartoon character, right. you know? But, but this to me is like, I, I know, I, 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 no, I, by I, the way, I don't disagree that it's a great role and she did a great job with it and that that is rare because women, that that is a real subject. That's what I'm saying. Right? I'm not saying that there aren't movies that give women this satisfaction. I'm just saying- Relative to men, there's a lot less of these movies. Oh, but I'm arguing. See, I, okay, but I'm arguing the following. I'm saying first, that should not be a satisfaction that any of us are looking for. But first. you have never been deprived of what my my hypothesis says that you've never been deprived of that. So you don't know how it feels. You don't I, know how it feels to go to a movie but I don't, repeatedly and have women not a part of the the story. For instance. I have <laughs> no, but I'm not ar- so. That's what I'm saying. I'm not arguing that that women are way underrepresented in roles in movies. Okay, just like I wouldn't argue that Hispanics are extremely underrepresented. I right? mean, Guzman, he's in all sorts <laughs> of movies. Right, exactly. But so that's true. But imagine, so I, so this is where I'd say, let's just take Hispanics, right? If if a movie comes out where there's this basically Hispanic creepy dude who's insane and kills everyone. And then I'm like, see, Hispanics aren't all bad. See, Hispanics are, are empowered individuals that can go on killing sprees, you see? Right. right. Like, no, that's not good. Right. Now, if the Hispanic is the smart guy who figures out all the stuff, and or maybe he is the hero who goes and shoots a lot of bad guys, fine. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a psychopath who is insane and evil. Well, and so be proud about the fact that there is an actress getting a great role, and I really wish there were more more of that but don't look for look up to her actions as a character and this is why we need more abstraction but, but they're not they're, they're 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 careful on the internet to say 
they're not looking up to her. That they're, that's that's okay. that's not what they're saying. Right. They're not they're not using they're not saying what a good role model for women. <laughs> okay. They're 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 just saying that it's feminist in that they have a full character for a woman. That's all that they're saying. Which they're saying happens so rarely that it's nice to see. And in that way, it's feminism. But but the message is getting mixed, right? Because that is a great... What you just said sounds great. Like, you know what? There's an example of a movie with a leading awesome role for a female with lots of facets, Oscar-worthy potential, you know, all these kind of things, right? Awesome. I'm sure it'll win a right. bunch of Oscars. But on the other hand... I hear, or at least you were saying things like, you know, because this shows how society and men can turn a woman to these extreme, like that. No, now you're talking about the character. <laughs> right. right, and that's what they're saying. That's what she said, just, just you know, uh, a depiction of the ways that society controls women and forces them into certain roles and then lets men basically do whatever they want. Amy Dunn might have been a monster, but she's no psychopath. No, she's Frankenstein's monster stitched together by a husband, parents, and a social order that demanded she be certain things rather than who she really was. Yeah, I, so, let, so let me read uh, a little bit more. This is from a different article. And this is about, do you remember the cool girl speech? This is what happens, I think, when she's in the car. And she's talking about, she's looking at the other girls yep. in the other car. Yep. This was apparently better in the book. Uh, it was more kind of impactful in the book. So I'll, I'll just read from the book here, okay? So there are a lot of reactions on the internet to, to, to this scene. So let's read it. Being a cool girl means I am a hot, brilliant, funny woman who adores football, poker, dirty jokes, and burping, who plays video games, drinks cheap beer, loves threesomes and anal sex, and jams hot dogs and hamburgers into her mouth like she's hosting the world's biggest culinary gangbang while somehow maintaining a size two because cool girls are, above all, hot. Hot and understanding. Cool girls never get angry. They only smile in a chagrined, loving manner and let their men do whatever they want. Go ahead, shit on me. I don't mind. I'm the cool girl. Men actually think this girl exists. Maybe they're fooled because so many women are willing to pretend to be this girl. Oh, and if you're not a cool girl, I beg you not to believe that your man doesn't want the cool girl. It may be a slightly different version. Maybe he's vegetarian. So a cool girl loves Satan. What's Satan, by the way? Satan? Satan? S-E-I-T-A-N? Some kind of food. And is great with dogs. Or maybe he's a hipster artist. So a cool girl is a tattooed, bespeckled nerd who loves comics. There are variations to the window dressing. But believe me, he wants cool girl, who is basically the girl who likes every fucking thing he likes and doesn't ever complain. How do you know you're not cool girl? Because he says things like, I like strong women. If he says that to you, he will at some point fuck someone else because I like strong women is code for I hate strong women. So what do you think about that? Very well written. It makes me want to read the book. Um, I can relate to that sentiment as a man, meaning growing up and thinking like, man, what's what's a cool guy all about? You know, look at those those cool guys, those those guys right there in that group right there. How are they automatically cool? OK, they seem to just always be a little funny, but not too funny. And they they don't smile too much. See, I smile a lot. I see my, how big my smile. They don't smile that much. And and when when they ask them how their day is going, they never say like, oh, dude, it's great. No, no, no. They're never overly emotive. And they always like catch the football. They don't drop it and like trip. They're, those are thoughts that go through guys' head. As I, so I can relate to those. Sentences. So you're saying that this isn't just a woman thing. No, exactly. I'm you're saying that those feelings of of inadequacy when compared to mythical perfection that is apparently exemplified by some specimens that you look at and you're like, well, that must be a cool person. That must be. That's real and it happens to everyone. So a lot of the internets are saying that this is a wonderful part of the book that outs a very problematic part of society that is definitely just women. Right. Is what they're is what they're saying. But you disagree with that. Definitely disagree. Because um, the fallacy there, I guess, would be that oh, women will marry just about anyone. Uh, you know, guys, guys have no problems getting women because women just want any guy. Uh, it's guys that can do whatever the fuck they want and the girls will still love them. It's like oh, I, know, I have so many friends that are single that they couldn't land a date if if they had the money. So like they can't because they they are not the kind of thing that females would be attracted right. and so, they struggle with that. Yeah, so there's two things that I'll say. One is is that I agree with you that when I read that I thought 
well, when I first read it, I thought, oh, wow, that is kind of a thing. I mean, the way that she writes, it's very convincing. Yeah. I'm just like, oh, man, Absolutely. men are assholes. <laughs> and then I thought, wait a second. And I thought the same thing you did. I thought, yeah. there are so many men that are desperate right. to have an attachment and will do anything and will do anything, yeah. will become anything for that woman. Yeah. And, and, and and I've seen firsthand people that I knew that that sublimated their personality and themselves because of this other person, men and women, right? Yeah. And become something they, they're not real and, you know, whatever. I don't think so, you mean sublimate. I think you mean submerge. Uh, sublimated in the sense that they, they give up. Okay. But the other thought I had was that... We definitely live in a sexist culture, correct? Absolutely. And the primary it's, it's, yeah, it's the beneficiant rem- of that sexist culture are men. White men especially, yes, absolutely. Yeah. So we might assume, based on that, that on average, women probably have to deal with this more than men do. That's where I tend to disagree. Well, let me, let me give you an example. Yep. So uh, football, for instance. You know, it used to be a, a man thing. Right. And now women are starting to get hip to it. Right. Something like 45 percent of the NFL fans are women now or something like that. Now, one way of looking at that is that football has just been really effective at marketing to women and football is a great sport. Another way of looking at it is that women said, look, my man's going to be watching football all weekend long. I either join him or I have no husband. Think of another thing that's like that where men made the switch to a woman thing. I can't think of anything. I can think of many. What? But for start, like I feel intimidated sometimes by talking to a woman who is wearing a sports jersey because I have to be that guy that's not I a true guy who's Total. into sports. Well, right? you're, you're talking about something that I, I'm on board with, but yeah. but I don't think you know the question I'm well, asking. Well, but, but I'm getting to it. Because the question I, I'm asking is, yeah. is some overall societal shift of something major that men did to you know, on the hypothesis that women came over to the men's side to be with men, to adapt to the men culture. What have men done on a on such a huge scale? And I could come up with other examples that, that women have done. Well, I mean, unless, unless you know, it depends how and you And we're generalizing it. here because there's plenty of women that have been into football sure. since the beginning of time. Sure. So I feel that there are many activities that we subject ourselves that uh, at least at first feel not quite what you would tend to do automatically as a guy. And I'm talking about certain ways we celebrate things like Valentine's Day, certain types of movies that are considered the date movies, uh, certain types of things you're supposed to do uh, when you're trying to impress your girl. We can say that the, the cool girl or the cool person, shall we say, aspect of society is perhaps more on the woman than on the man on average. There's no way to prove this point, but but when I when cuz the other thing to think about, Berto, is that you and I are sensitive, liberal, basically I would call myself a feminist. I think you would call yourself an an equality-minded person. And so, you know, we're open and we're right. open to feedback right. and and we'll we'll listen to our partners and we'll, you know, we'll talk it out. I I'm guessing there are a lot of people that don't mind reveling in their privilege, shall sure. we say. They don't Absolutely. mind capitalizing on their yep. privilege. Yep, yep. And if you're if it, and men and women included. It yep. just so happens Absolutely. that men are privileged over women. That's and right. so when, you know, you average everything out, my guess is is that the cool girl thing is more prevalent than the cool guy thing. It's just just a just a thought. But I see, okay, yeah. So it's it's still weird to me because uh I I would venture to say that there's way more uncool guys than cool guys out there, right? Like if we were doing a little bell curve, I think in society one would say there are way more uncool guys than cool guys, right? I'm not sure what you're saying, but... Meaning uh, if you go to any average high school or college or any social gathering and you were to rank guys by their coolness or their power or whatever, uh, there's way more on the average or low side than there are on the... Oh, that's why, you know... then, Then compared to women? No, no, guys uh, compared to guys. Oh, so, so like when you when like this is why there's, this there's is only why, a few cool guys and there's a whole yeah, drove of uncool. Yeah, guys. this is why okay. you notice that at the dance club, like eighty percent of the females are looking at the same three guys. They're not actually looking around saying, "Well, those three are having plenty of attention." There's that guy in the corner. I'm gonna go talk to him. Right. It's an interesting hypothesis. Um, Where, whereas, where my flip side was that the flip the flip side is that. Uh, most guys uh, around the world, right, 
uh, their their imperative is like must find female, must find mate, right? Uh, and they're actually a lot, uh, at least in the moment, they're a lot less discerning, I suppose. So they're they're not actually going like, well, she's not that cool. Like, what, is this something you relate to? Because I don't. I don't actually relate at all to the idea of being at a party or in school or anywhere and thinking, well, she's not cool enough. She's cool. No, it's just looks and <laughs> and 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 what what they're saying maybe a little bit. But, like, it's pretty much just look. So you're sitting there in your classroom, and you're like, oh, she's a cheerleader. Oh, she's pretty attractive. That's pretty attractive. So then you could say, oh, well, that's what we're talking about. She's cool. She's not cool. But guess what? It's the same with guys. He's pretty attractive. That's the, how it works. Yeah. And so in the end, like, I absolutely agree that it is that we have a sexist culture for, for that's been, you know, evolving very slowly through the millennia, but we're still there. Uh, but I don't think it's about that, that the sexism thing, I don't think is exemplified by that some people are cool and many others are not. I think that's just I'm not human even sure society. I'm on. I don't even know. Yeah. But, you know, the, what I'm saying by the cool girl, I'm talking about people that are trying to please their partners at the cost of their own identity. That's what I'm saying by cool girl. But isn't that how we, don't we, um, sorry. You're talking we, about actual cool people. <laughs> well, but don't we represent them that way in all media for guys too? Because like usually the hero in, in uh, uh, what's, you know, uh, what's this movie? Roots? <laughs> no, the boombox. <laughs> oh. Peter, Peter Gabriel. I thought you were holding up <laughs> Kuta Kente. <laughs> no. Because in Roots, he holds up Kunta Kinsa. I'm holding up a boombox. <laughs> uh, say you anything. You know, say anything. Okay. The hero in Say Anything. The other movie like... I thought, if, I, if you didn't say Say Anything, was Platoon. <laughs> okay. Right. Oh, because he's on the, Yeah. No, so most most movies like I'm say sure you anything. just hold your hands up and you go, what movie is this? <laughs> it's like the Ten Commandments? What? <laughs> yeah, you just hold up your hands. What movie? What movie? <laughs> you should know. And I said Well, it, it only took you two... Well, I gave you more hints. But anyways, the point is, in a movie like Say Anything, the hero is decidedly not the quote unquote cool dude, right? Unless we define cool as being no, true you're, to yourself. No, I don't think you're understanding what I mean by cool. No, no, but 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 I am because in that movie, the people that are all the jocks and the things and stuff, they're not being true to themselves because they're trying to be something they're not because they're trying to appease the girls because they need to be jocks because they need to be rich because they need to be this. No, they, no, no, no. The point the point that they're saying that the author is saying in this in this bit here is that for some people, the jock, that's who they are. And they are the jock on the outside, and they're the jock on the inside. But that's not how we portray it for guys at all. But we portray jocks as they're 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 only doing that to impress the females because may, they're maybe, not really. But, but that that's way. a separate point. The point of what we're talking about here is that some people have, shall we say, an innate personality, whatever that is, and there are what she's saying is that women are forced and not men. <laughs> women are forced to change that identity often to fit into a their their particular man's world, whether he's into beer and pizza or he's into comics or he's into yoga and vegetarianism. She will fit his world because that's what the cool girl does. That so, that's the point. So and, and so it's not whether or not you're cool or a jock or anything or good looking. It's just But that's exactly what I'm saying. Identity. You you missed it three times. I'm saying the jock is doing what he's doing just so that he can impress the females. That's how we portray it in all the movies, the 80s movies, all those movies. They're not really, they're not really, that's not the real personality. Okay. That's why the I don't hero I, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I don't necess I'm not necessarily on board with that, but what's your point with that? Like, look, just in my own life, right? I'm 12 years old. I'm in the car with my- So you're saying that you're, sorry, you're giving, so a, 14, let me, uh, you're giving uh, examples of 13, men 14. having to do that as well. I, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so, yeah. so got I, it. I'm 14. I'm in the car with my 15-year-old cousin and her boyfriend who is 18 years old, okay? And I'm again, I'm 14. Her boyfriend's 18 years old. So I'm a little boy. <laughs> He's a man <laughs> at, that, at that age. There's these huge differences in those four years. And, and maybe I'm 13, 13 or 14. And we're sitting in the car and, uh, and he's playing every song he's playing on the radio. She thinks is the coolest song ever. And I'm saying like, 
oh, he, and then I just start getting the sense of like, man, he's got such taste. And then later she literally says to me, it's like, see, you need, you need more personality like him. <laughs> she says that to me. Right. And then I hear this a lot. Like, like I, I remember this was the theme. Granted, this was in Colombia. So maybe Colombia isn't like, but it was this theme of like, oh, you got to have a good personality if you want. What person I am myself. What personality are you talking about? Yeah. It's the same thing. And you know what? It's like, well, what music do they like? Oh, they like this. Well, look at the clothes they're wearing. Oh, they have those shoes with the pump. Oh, they seem to, those seem to be cool shoes. That's all there. And, and in the end, what, what you end up doing as a, as a person growing up as a teenager stuff, you end up doing exactly that. You end up trying to like, oh, how can I be a little cooler? So I can, and I think that happens to both boys and girls. Right. And what you're, what you're, you're using the word cool to be cool to kind of a general group, but in the book, she's talking about being cool to one particular person. Yeah. It's usually yep. one gender to that. Okay, so the last thing I want to do is to provide some analyses using my typical analysis process here. So here, here's my analysis of Nick. All right, so and, and I have limited information, and I've I've read accounts of what the book is about to give some more meat to mm -hmm. analyze. So in the book, and and in the I don't think this is in the movie, but but from what what I've read about what's in the book is Nick's parents were very conflictual. Like one of the things that he the father Nick's father would often say was "stupid bitch" to his to his mom. You know, so so Nick is growing up with this conflictual parents uh, with conflictual parents, and the dad is saying things like "you stupid bitch," and so. He grows up with that, and I don't. This I think this is in the movie where at some point he's like stupid bitch to the nurse, yeah. yeah. But then we were meant to think it's just because of his Alzheimer's or something or right. his disease. Right. I forget what disease. Oh no, I thought Nick said it too. No, Nick oh. closes the gate when he says that because he's like, uh, ah. Oh well, Nick says it in the book, oh, I see. And, and also in the movie. You remember when Nick is like, "Why are women all against me?" Remember yes, that? Yes, I do remember that. Yeah. So that was a little bit of data there about misogyny. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so uh, Nick's dad was anti-woman, and his mom, I think, didn't fight back, if I remember right. So he internalizes this conflictual dyad in, from his parents. He internalizes this relationship, as all, as all children do. And it's, it's a difficulty inside of him. It's, it's not a warm and fuzzy internalization. It's, it's got conflictual parts to it. He's ambivalent about who he wants to be loyal to, and he doesn't know which side is right because he wants to love both parents, but, they, but the internalized representation of them has become conflictual. So he needs to externalize this because when we externalize it, it becomes more livable for us, even though it's not ultimately livable. So he needed to engineer a conflictual marriage with someone so he could externalize this internalization. So he finds Amy, but he didn't want to find a weak woman like his mom. So he instead, he finds someone that's strong, like, like Amy. You know, she comes across as kind of strong, like a right, strong personality right. at the beginning. But, so that's his conscious mind saying, she's nothing like my mom, so our relationship's going to be totally different. But he still needs to externalize this unconsciously, and he does it. And there's a scene where he actually tries to socialize her into a fight. He tries to socialize her into nagging him while he's playing video games. Remember that? Yeah. He's playing video games. He's unemployed. She comes home from work or looking for a job, and she's kind of looking at him, and, and, and she's like, so what have you been doing today? And she's not nagging. She's just kind of she's, – she's a little bit pissed yep. off, but, but not bad, you know? And he's like – Man, get off my back! You know I'm not gonna, you know, blah, right. blah, blah. and and she's and she's like, whoa, like what are you doing? And he and then he says, right. oh, I'm sorry, I guess I'm just kind of right. stressed out. And so he was trying to, but 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 by the way, that's in the psychopath's diary, the fake diary. Oh really? Yep. Oh okay. God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> so we don't know. <laughs> yeah. So her, she's more interesting to analyze. All right. So she internalized neglectful parents. It's pretty clear from the movie that her parents don't really love her for who she is, right? Absolutely. Okay. She, so, so she needed to find a neglectful man to treat her like an object the same way her parents treated her. If you remember, they had this series of books that they wrote about the amazing Amy, and, right. she, and the amazing Amy was perfect. And Amy wasn't perfect because she's a normal person. And so she's growing up with this rival that's perfect, that can be written to be perfect, and everyone loves her. The... The parents love her. The public loves her. And here she is, this normal, flawed human being growing up and feeling rejected by her parents and by everyone uh, in, in the shadow of this perfect Amy character that has her name. And so, and her parents apparently didn't 
give her enough love and attachment to make up for this issue because it would have been an issue for any kid but you would imagine that if the parents gave Amy enough love that you know it would have been okay but but this complicated thing so, so she grows up being insecurely attached and has a lot of complexes regarding attachment and about closeness so when she met Nick she desperately wanted a secure attachment with someone so she becomes the cool girl she becomes someone that will please him she'll do anything to get him to love her because she always wanted a secure attachment. She always wanted someone that she could depend upon. But ultimately, when you act like someone else, that person has a hard time loving you because they know that you're not actually acting genuine. And so usually relationships start to crumble with that uh, foundation when it's based on a lie, right? Can, can you relate to that at all? Yep, that makes sense. So over time, distance was established and she became preoccupied and fearful about losing him. Then she found him cheating on her, okay? She actually saw, she went to go f- see him and instead sees him kissing this girl. Right. And this is traumatic. I mean, imagine this happening to you. Right. You know, you, you walk up and, and you, you know, you're like, oh, there's, there's my spouse. What, what is my spouse doing with that other person? Oh my God, they're making out. Right. I had this happen to a client of mine once, and I can tell you, this d- does a number on one's brain that does not go away for a long time. I mean, it he he caught his spouse and had to listen to them. It was terrible. But anyway, so you know, if this is a fictional character, but you know, imagine this happening to a, a real Amy. This would alter her brain. So not only has she had a lifetime of rejection, but now she's being rejected in this really humiliating, harsh traumatic shocking way and this is when her her defense mechanism of psychopathy and narcissism really kicks in this is when she does that flip to like i'm gonna get him he is done right up until this point she's desperately reaching out to him right i mean at least it it seems that way she wants him to love her but it's not working and then she catches him cheating and then that's when she decides it's over it's on i'm gonna i'm gonna get him you know what I mean? I, I do know what you mean, but I, I don't agree with the timeline. And the reason why she does this is because she wants to rid herself of the pain of rejection that she experienced since birth. Right. So she's trying to get rid of that pain, and she thinks that if she gets back at Nick, that it will release her from that pain. But ultimately, it doesn't, which leads her back to Nick, because she that's ultimately what she always wanted from the beginning since she was born, was someone that she could depend upon. And she gets that in a fake way at the end, but it's as close as she thinks she can get it. Yeah, no, that 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 is a... That is a uh, very interesting perspective. I, For me, if that were the story, if that were the narrative, then I would absolutely agree to say, yeah, you know what? That is a depiction of a female who may or may not have had psychological issues anyways, but she clearly was driven by this realization and her, her the, the past she had had to endure plus that realization. And that triggers her to act completely irrationally. And it's too sad and blah, blah. And I see it. But they do didn't write it that way right because they they left they they laid out her own uh confession about her her entire life pretty much that they didn't give us the the early details but we do have the early details about her previous relationship where she was already a psychopath and she says that from the moment she met him she started manipulating him and doing just and behaving just the right ways shaving her pussy doing all these things just right ways that she knew would get him and that she was acting the whole time, essentially, and that then she was like, then, Be- because you know. because she wanted a close relationship with somebody. Oh, sure, just like absolutely, just not like be, not, Ted Bundy wanted a close relationship. That's why he married someone and pretended to be completely normal. Absolutely, and he and he was normal with her. With her, absolutely. But that doesn't mean he every, wasn't a psychopath from the beginning. No, I'm not saying. Yeah. Well, well, it's interesting. I mean, so so again, it's a fictional character, so yeah, it's, it's all just you know like play. If she hadn't already ruined a man's life that seemed like a perfectly reasonable but, man. But, but okay, so you're actually going against, if I might call you out, your own philosophy about people being evil and this kind of thing. You're labeling her as evil, essentially. You're saying that she was... A psychopath, yeah. She, like, she, was, she was evil. Like, well, like I, I don't she, believe She in... wanted to harm people from the beginning of the whole thing. She wanted to harm Nick from the beginning. I, I mean, I won't call it evil in the, in the witch's sense. I just mean... Antisocial, <laughs> but, but she was out to hurt Nick from the start. Oh, like, uh, like, not necessarily use Nick. I, she was out to use Nick for what though? 
to, to have the kind of uh, relationship she thought she wanted. Right, but that's everyone does that. <laughs> but not in a but not in the same way, right? Like but but people, if we just if we just describe it in a slightly different, if we spin it just slightly different, from what you're saying, she desperately wanted closeness, as all people do. That's right. And and you could and did what she could out of desperation in the beginning. But, to, but to get him so that she yeah. could get some affection from someone that she desperately wanted, it didn't work out. But but I mean, there's there's some subtly subtlety lost there because like it is true that most people act self interested, and when they're at the party and they decide to go up and talk to someone, it's not altruistic. They're they think they can get at something out of there. But most people aren't having those conversations literally. Like they're not actually sitting there going, I think. If I pretend to be into sports with that guy, he might introduce me to that other person there who I think has the power to hire me at this other firm. Right. And I'm going to pretend for six weeks to be into sports and lie to this person's face. So I can. most people don't do that. Right, right. And, 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 and it's a good point and, and, uh, and it's well received. Uh, but I think what you're saying is that the psychopath is motivated by psychopathy. And what I'm saying is another spin on that is that she was ultimately or fundamentally motivated by her desire for closeness that she did not get growing up and used psychopathy to get get it. And I agree with that. Okay. But it doesn't excuse it. It's just, no, I'm not saying it's excuse just it. A, a, but, yeah. but it's interesting that when horrible human beings are analyzed by people like me and in, in a way that to some extent gives a, a heart to that individual or some kind of reason, some justifiable, so to speak, reason about how their personality developed that it's interpreted as if I and these other people are excusing or saying it's, it's justified that they did all the horrible things they did. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that there's, people aren't born evil, that people are b- born with all the same basic desires. They, they want to have closeness, they want love, they want security, and that when things get weird, either genetically or environmentally or both, then that's when stuff like this happens. Yes, and that makes sense. I don't, I don't actually, I want to make sure, I don't want to use the word evil, because I don't believe in evil by, because to me, evil implies uh, supernatural, and it implies uh, some sort of uh, platonic, reality that we don't know about that's good or evil. Yeah. It also implies a binary. Yeah, yeah. But what I do believe is that uh, either genetically or from a very early age, some people end up going down the what I'll call wrong path and they end up wanting to or having compulsions to hurt others, sometimes in very, very bad ways, right? And as someone who doesn't, to who really cannot stand the idea of suffering inflicted on others, I don't have room in my life or the society I would have for that kind of behavior, especially in the extreme. So if, if you have a button that can you know, destroy half of humanity and you have someone that really wants to push it because you know what, they were yelled at a lot as a child and they never got to eat their soup at night. Well, I, I'm sorry, man, I do feel for you, but you cannot fucking push that button. Totally, right? yeah, absolutely. As a person that does have to deal with people like this, yeah. I can tell you that I absolutely have sympathy for them. I would never excuse their behavior. I, I'm one of those few therapists. When I when I talk with other therapists, I'm usually the only one in the room that will say, you understand what that client did was wrong, right? You understand it's morally wrong what that client did, right? Because a lot of times therapists will become too enamored with their clients to the point where they can't see the forest through the trees and, and they can't see the immorality of their clients' behaviors. Yep. And so I'll often say, just you know, just a reminder that what that client did was a horrible, immoral act. And I'm not talking about like murder because I, I don't have clients like that, but you know, things like um, a teenager who verbally abuses their parents on a weekly basis. Right. You know, if the teenagers in therapy, what I see a lot of their maybe particularly novice therapists will do is they'll start making excuses. Well, if the parents weren't such bad parents, then the right. kid wouldn't do that. And certainly there are family system factors as to why the kid is that way, or at least you could hypothesize that. But it still doesn't justify verbal abuse. Right. It doesn't justify scaring people. That's that's never okay. It's it's an immoral act and it's wrong. Now as therapists, we're not moral morality police, but we still have to keep that in mind. So I'm definitely not saying that. 
w- what I am saying is that I have treated people that have had extremely uh, difficult interpersonal relationship histories, similar to Amy's, without all the killing and the slashing and the blood, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> or the, well, there's just one killing and slashing and blood um, and all the manipulation. There are people that walk around in this world that, you know, are totally normal human beings. They're not crazy people. They don't do all this wackadoo stuff. They have jobs. They have careers. They have families. They're completely, you know, normal in in every way, except when it comes to attachment, they have so much deficit and so much insecurity and so much need that they will act in extremely desperate ways and react quite excessively right. to even the slightest hint of a rejection not because they're evil or because they're horrible human beings but because it feels so horrible to them right. that it compels their reaction so that's all i'm saying is yep. that is that i can see her through that lens yep. that we know that her parents were not great and we know that things were complicated or at least you know we could speculate that and again it's a fictional character but you know, her parents certainly seemed a little empty and vacant and not Absolutely. not very attentive to yeah. their Until daughter. Until she disappears. <laughs> right. But even then, it yeah. seemed a little fake. Like yeah, the, yeah. It's all about the media. Putting on. Um, no, I, and listen. I So I want to also clarify. Uh, I absolutely feel extreme sympathy for uh, almost, I think, almost any story that I come across that's like a serial killer or something, especially if you find out about their their upbringing because in many cases in many cases they they had some severe abuse and things like that not all times but in many cases the problem is that the next step is what i always take issue with right and the next step for me means like for me personally so i'm saying is like i can be very sad about something but it doesn't mean i'm not going to take the steps necessary to rectify the situation totally we need a just society we need rules and we need we need measures to take care of the of me and the people I love, and and so she absolutely needs to be prosecuted and and locked up. <laughs> and so in her in her example, that's why I take issue with and maybe well, I'm and, just and misunderstanding be, because it. because the vast majority of people that have her history right. do not do what she did. They they have a lot of interpersonal problems. Exactly. Okay. That that's I think ultimately what I take an issue with is. And, and it was similar with the Elliot Roger case, but this is very specific, which is don't prop her up. Prop up the person that had those problems and actually is a good human being. Yeah. Prop that up. If, if you want to say like, oh, that's a good role model. And I'm I'm not saying that everyone's saying that it's a good movie or that, that it's a good feminist movie because she has a strong role as an actress. That's That makes only enough sense. Uh, even, even if it's, even if the message is, oh, and the movie and the book also make some interesting points about the pressures that society puts on women. I would argue that also men, but to be a certain way and conform. Absolutely. Let's have that discussion. Totally. I will stop short of, I can almost relate to her. That meaning... In her actions that I can't possibly relate to. You know? Right. And I and there are people saying that. Yeah. So what's the final word? Uh, well, A, I love the movie. I will lie. I, I really think I want to read the book now. Mm. I, I I agree with whoever's all the people. And it sounds like you as well as saying that, hey, this is a good it's a refreshment, refreshing to see a strong female lead in a very complex role. I, I really appreciated that. It was very subtle. There was a lot of subtlety to it. Uh, I liked the fact that it uh, was ambivalent and it had a bad ending. I really enjoyed that. I don't, yeah, I, I wouldn't go down the side of uh, that I agree with her character or anything like that line. I, I don't think, I'm not like, but the dude was awesome. You know, he's, like I said, he was in the end not a very bright individual and he, and, and, and in the end he made a terrible choice in my opinion, right? Well, it's interesting but, because <laughs> people watching the movie would say that he was a douchebag. Like they actually, like if you read comments, and I think the book actually portrays him as worse. Yeah, that might be. I actually think that Fincher and the the author who did the screenplay made some decisions to make the Nick character more likable, so there would be someone that was likable in the movie. Because I I guess in the book he's a lot less likable. I I on it. I gotta I gotta say that I'd be very surprised if the 
majority of the sentiments about him being a douchebag are in the combination of A, the simple fact that he had an affair, and B, the scenes that she was narrating to make it make the case in her diary. That's my theory. Yeah, but for some people, the simple fact that he had an affair yes, is, is, enough, enough is enough for them yes. to and convict I, him of being a douchebag. And I would say, fine, if that's how we're defining people that, that cheat and that equals douchebag, well, fine, let's let's agree that he's a douchebag. However, I'm I'm not... I'm not even arguing that. And, and not only did he cheat on her, but he cheated on her with a really young, hot girl that was a student of his. So you know, you know it's a oh vi- right, they it's, stacked, they stacked. Yeah, they the very. Deck. They it wasn't yes. just like a neighbor. Right. That's why I was saying early on. I was saying that they used a very stereotypical affair, right? It's right. the it's, in in the office at at the right. university. The, the, the worst thing is if he was a high school teacher, but then that would have been a different kind of movie. Right. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, so yeah, you're right. In that sense, I could see how people would just be like, well, dude, look what he was doing. Uh, but I don't, maybe it's because Ben Affleck did do a good job. I felt he was a little more subtle than just that. I just thought that he was, like I said, I keep coming to this thing. Like, I don't think he was in the end very clever because like, I, I can't believe he thought his only option was to stick around with her. And that was it. Like that seemed... If anything, and maybe this was their their ultimate point, was now he's the one completely modifying his life and wants and needs and everything just to be with her. And so he's become the cool guy. The final word for me is as a marital therapist and someone that often thinks about intimacy and honesty and the way a relationship feels and communication, I have to say that when I was watching it, and particularly at the beginning and at the end, because there's this ending scene where it basically ends with him saying, how do you really know your spouse or something, I think is what they keep turning to. Anyway, yep. my, 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 the, my final word is that for people out there, give it some thought. I, I don't know what to do. I don't know. It's a very you know personal thing. But how well do you know your spouse? How well have you let your spouse know you? Your, your partner, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, how have how honest are you? How much do you let them into your world? When when you have a, a odd thought, you know how how often do you do you tell them about it? How interested are you in your partner's inner life? That's what I pull away from it. It's it's sort of a a side note to the overall story of the of the movie, but but that was definitely some that was the thing that they started off with, which was there he, he you know it's this point of view scene where he's lying in bed with her and her head is on his chest and and he's all you see is her head and his chest, and he's looking at the top of her head and he's saying things like how well do you really know your wife how right. how well do you? and I thought that that was a very real universal experience of looking across at your partner and saying, do I really know you? Because sometimes I feel like I totally get you. And other times I feel like I have no idea who you are. Yeah. Well, that does it for another episode of psychology in Seattle. Thanks for joining us and please take care of yourself and do not frame your partner for murder and get them the death penalty. Well, well, to be fair, if you do, which you probably should, but if you do, don't go back on your plan and then go kill someone. Like, that's that's compounding the bad mistakes. Right. So, fine. So, you know, some people will frame their husband for, or wife. Fine, right? But just don't make it worse on yourself is all we're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Quit while you're ahead. Yes. Yes. <laughs>